Welcome to the MPP Hoot, where we give you a recap of last week's news on everything education. In Cleveland, Tennessee, Lee University is considering limiting the speech on gender and sexuality from students. This would include limiting students on how they behave, what they wear, and what they can say both online or on campus. If approved, the policy would prohibit students from identifying as anything other than their biological sex. In addition, students would be banned from questioning the restrictions or any other university policy. This proposal has led to criticism from previous students. A leaked draft of the policy stated that biological sex is binary and that humans do not have the ability or observed right to choose a gender. The policy also forbids sex between unmarried heterosexuals. According to the U.S. Department of Education, federal law prohibits discrimination based on sex, sexual orientation, or gender identity for educational programs that receive federal funds. However, religious schools like Lee University are exempt if those protections disrupt the religious tenets that the organization holds. Prior to her high school graduation ceremony, a Native American student was forced to remove an eagle feather in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. According to the student, Lena Black, she'd previously been told that she was permitted to wear her feather attached to her mortarboard because of its cultural significance. In addition, Black noted that she passed several checkpoints during the ceremony before a school counselor and security guard physically tried to remove the feather. According to School Indian Education Coordinator, Rich Palpa, the confrontation occurred because of a miscommunication about protocols for adding culturally significant items at the graduation ceremony. The district's website states that mortarboards must be absent of decorations. According to Lena's mother, Marcy Black, the family wasn't notified of any protocols, and they have since received an apology from the school's district. On Friday, Sri Lankan authorities closed schools in an effort to prepare for a fuel shortage that's anticipated to last for days during the nation's worst economic crisis in decades. Additionally, the Public Administration Ministry requested that public officials stay home from work on Friday, except for those who maintain essential services. Also on Friday, private schools were closed. Currently, Sri Lanka is almost without gasoline, as thousands of people continue to wait in queues at fuel stations across the country for days on end. Meanwhile, the government has struggled to find the money to pay for gas imports and other essentials, as the Indian Ocean Island nation is on the verge of facing bankruptcy. The economic crisis has led to political strife, as the government continues facing extensive protests. Moreover, protesters have inhabited the entrance to the president's office for more than a month, urging President Gotabaya Rajapaksa to resign. Protesters have also blocked main roads to demand gas and fuel. For months now, Sri Lankans have faced long lines to buy their essentials, most of which are imported from abroad. Plus, shortages of hard currency have limited the imports of raw materials for manufacturing and have increased inflation. Authorities have made countrywide announcements of power cuts, which can be up to four hours a day because they cannot supply enough fuel to power generating stations. Currently, Sri Lanka's total foreign debt is $51 billion, but the finance ministry says that the country, as of now, only has $25 million in usable foreign funds. This year, Sri Lanka has suspended repayment of about $7 billion in foreign loans out of $25 billion to be repaid by 2026. In his high school graduation ceremony on Sunday, Xander Moritz discussed his experiences and activism as the first openly gay class president in Pineview High School. However, in the commencement speech, he never said that he was gay. After the school's president warned Moritz that he'd cut his microphone if he mentioned his activism, Moritz decided to use a euphemism for his sexual orientation. He chose his curly hair. According to Moritz, the censoring was dehumanizing. However, he didn't want to risk ruining the ceremony for his peers. Xander Moritz is the youngest plaintiff to be in a lawsuit against what's publicly known as the Don't Say Gay Bill. The U.S. Department of Education recently hosted a virtual summit 
which was the first of its kind. This summit spotlighted steps that schools, colleges, and communities can take to better support students with disabilities and mental health needs. On Monday, May 23rd, the half-day virtual summit brought together educators, advocates, coordinators, and other professionals to discuss prevalent issues affecting students with disabilities and mental health needs. In addition, the summit focused on the unity between schools and families to ensure effective implementation of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. U.S. Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona said that as we continue recovering from COVID, it's important to recognize the unique challenges that some students have faced. That is, there are inequities between students with disabilities and their peers, which were exacerbated by the pandemic. The virtual summit essentially highlighted the department's commitment to supporting students with special needs and providing schools with the necessary tools to ensure all students can succeed. The summit included panels that discussed five main issue areas. One, the use of the American Rescue Plan funding to address learning losses and provide mental health support in K-12 schools. Two, the use of Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund to increase mental health support access for students in higher education. Three, supporting equitable pathways for people with disabilities as they transition from school to career. Four, considerations for digital accessibility in the emerging virtual and hybrid work and school environments. And five, some of the department's latest announcements and resources. According to new research by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, high school students' interest in the humanities is outpacing other academic fields. In 2018, the humanities saw the smallest share of new bachelor's degrees at 10.2% since 1987. From 1990 to 2019, the number of high school students taking social studies courses increased, which was largely due to the surge of students taking world history courses. This new research may mitigate previous fears about the humanities fading in K-12. According to Lawrence Posca, Executive Director of the National Council for the Social Studies, taking social studies courses can be beneficial in several ways. He noted that taking social studies courses can prepare students for many careers. Essentially, he said, lots of jobs require skills that humanities and social sciences teach. In addition, he highlighted how social studies may help students learn about their identity, culture, and communities. However, he noted that the recent surge in bills censoring topics around race, gender, and sexuality contradicts state curriculum standards and the goals of social studies education. A recent poll shows that a majority of Americans, 56%, believe that states should be required to provide K-12 public education to all children regardless of legality of their immigration status. Meanwhile, 27% were opposed and 17% said that they weren't sure. Responses were essentially equal among men and women. On the contrary, significantly more Democrats were in favor of educating all students than Republicans. Currently, the federal government provides all students with the right to public education regardless of their legal status. However, Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who's running for re-election, recently reported that he'd support challenging the U.S. Supreme Court decision that prohibits states from withholding the money needed to provide education to all. The associated Supreme Court ruling is Plyler v. Doe, which was established in 1982. This ruling resulted in the U.S. Department of Education asserting that all students have a right to education at public elementary and secondary schools. According to Abbott, who is a Republican, since the times are different, it could be the time to challenge this ruling again. Furthermore, he proposed that the federal government should pay for the public education of undocumented students instead of individual states. Recently, the governor of South Carolina, Henry McMaster, signed a bill into law that bans transgender students from participating in girls' or women's sports in public schools and colleges. In the past two years, nearly a dozen other states have signed similar laws. McMaster signed the bill quietly, meaning there was no fanfare or ceremony, and he did not post to social media like he did when signing other bills into law. This law requires transgender students to compete with 
and against the biological sex that's listed on their birth certificates filed at or near the time of birth. Those supporting the ban claim that transgender girls have an unfair biological advantage from being born stronger as males. Meanwhile, opponents assert that the bill is cruel as it excludes students who aren't elite athletes but want to compete and be with their friends. There is a growing list of states, which are mostly conservative, that are requiring transgender students to compete with the biological sex listed on their birth certificates, including Oklahoma, Arizona, and Tennessee. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode.